2012 and possibly further. Um, so the Federal Reserve can pick the short-term safe nominal interest rate I in the economy, but there's one thing it cannot do. It cannot drive an interest rate below zero. Um, there's nothing it can do to make someone willing to pay more than $1,000 today for a treasury bill which probably the government promised to pay you $1,000 in three months. Um, if it tries, people will say, huh, well, I have my $1,000 now. I'd just rather stick it in my safety deposit box for three months rather than pay $1,001 now to get a treasury bill worth $1,000. And that's not quite true. Uh, we do actually see some transactions at which people pay more than a thousand bucks for a treasury bill. Um, either they desperately want to have it as collateral for some particular transaction that requires a treasury bill rather than cash, um, or because they want to save on transactions costs by getting into the electronic system. Um, but interest rates generally don't go, the nominal interest rates generally don't go below zero, and that's where they are right now. The Federal Reserve can peg the short term safe nominal interest rate I. Um, but we're not terribly, businesses aren't terribly interested in what the short term interest rate is. Because a business building a factory um, has to think that it's going to be borrowing its money not just overnight, not just for the next three months, but for the next 10 to 20 years. Um, so businesses are much more interested in what are the interest rates that are currently being charged for 10 or 20 year loans. Um, and the long term safe nominal interest rate, IL, um, what the US Treasury has to pay to borrow, what government bonds are currently sell for, depends not just on what um, I today is, but on what bond speculators expect the Federal Reserve to make the short term interest rate in the future. Hence, there's this term premium that we're going to write row to the superscript T, T for term premium. And the long term interest rate on Treasury bonds is going to be equal to the short term interest rate on Treasury bills, um, plus this term premium. Um, what is this term premium? Um, well, here we plot both the three month Treasury bill interest rate um, against the 10 year um, Treasury bond interest rate. And the term premium is best thought of as what people expect the Federal Reserve to do over the next 10 years, plus some other terms, plus some extra allowance for the fact that if you're investing in a long-term bond, it's a risky thing to do. Uh, maybe the bond price will go down over the next three months, and maybe you'll want to sell it over the next three months. Um, with a Treasury bill, you know you only have to wait three months to get your money back in full. With a Treasury bond, you have to wait fully 10 years to be sure certain of getting your money back in full. There's risk involved in holding such a security. Generally, um, so generally what you can say is that whenever it's the case that the long-term Treasury interest rate is less than the short-term interest rate, people are expecting the Federal Reserve to quickly cut short-term interest rates as people were expecting them in 2001. Uh, people were saying the next move in short-term interest rates is likely to be down, um, so we're not going to hold, um, you know, we're not going to be willing to hold the Treasury bond um, unless its interest rate um, is, uh, unless interest interest, but given, not that, but given that we expect um, the next move in short-term interest rates to be down, um, we're going to sell off some of our Treasury, long-term Treasury bonds now um, to make, no, that was too confused. Um, let me start over again. Um, that we have a choice between holding our money in a long-term Treasury bond and selling our long-term Treasury bond and then investing a whole bunch of money in our Treasury bills, but we invest in a Treasury bill now, in four years, we expect interest rates to be a lot lower than they are now. So as a result, we expect the interest rate on Treasury bills over the future to be relatively low. Because we expect the interest rate of the future on Treasury bills to be relatively low, we're willing to pay a relatively high price for Treasury bonds, which means we're actually willing to own Treasury bonds now, even though the interest rate we get on them is less than the interest rate we get right now on a Treasury bill, because we don't think this interest rate would stick. Um, we see this three times over the past generation. First, just before the start of this graph in 1989, um, a so-called inversion or four times, inversion of the yield curve. Um, second, during the 1998 Russian crisis, when for a while they thought it was going to be really bad and the Federal Reserve would cut short-term interest rates by a lot, which it did not do, at the peak of the dot-com bubble, and then at the peak of the housing bubble. There's this general expectation that the Federal Reserve is about to cut back um, on its short-term on its short-term interest rates. Um, and you also see that um, short-term and long-term interest rates move together whenever the Treasury does, or whenever the Federal Reserve does something relatively surprising. Nobody was expecting Alan Greenspan to raise interest rates in 1994 and 95 by as much as he did. Uh, people thought that he was going to mosey along keeping interest rates at their low level of 3% for an extra year or two. Um, at least that's what I thought at the Treasury. One of my analytical leaders when I worked at the Treasury was writing various memos for Secretary of the Treasury, Lloyd Benson, saying it looks like this low interest rate policy is going to continue for another year or two. Um, big mistake when he started raising interest rates rapidly. Um, not my mistake alone, because as the Treasury raised its short-term, or the Federal Reserve raised its short-term interest rates, people holding long-term bonds said, wait a minute, um, with these long-term bonds aren't worth holding at these prices, we've got to mark up the interest rates on long-term bonds as well. Um, Similarly, when no one had thought that the financial crisis would get as bad as it actually got. Um, you have this little recovery in the summer of 2008, and then when the Federal Reserve crisis really hits, the Federal Reserve cuts short-term interest rates to zero, long-term interest rates fall too, responding to the Federal Reserve's cut of short-term interest rates, um, and only then um, bouncing back up. The lesson you should get from this graph is that the Federal Reserve can move long-term interest rates as well as short-term interest rates. Whenever the Federal Reserve does something big um, to short-term interest rates, the market will follow and long-term interest rates will move too. Long-term interest rates won't move as much and they won't necessarily move as in sync. There's a lot of slippage between the short-term and the long-term interest rate. Um, and there's also risk and default premium in there. Um, that is, even if you know what the long-term treasury bond rate is, that doesn't help you very much as a business because companies cannot borrow at the treasury rate. Um, they might default, and when they do default, it's when their creditors would most want to have their money back. Um, so companies have to pay an interest rate premium that is greater than the expected default times the probability times the losses in default. If you take a look at um, you know, the treasury interest rate, um, this red line here, and then the interest rate that junk bonds um, are issued at. Um, say this is a junk bond issued interest rate, it's actually the treasury rate plus twice the spread between the BAA bond rate um, and the treasury rate. Um, this is a much better guide to the interest rates that risky companies would actually have to pay if they wanted to borrow money by issuing a bond at any point since 1990. Um, and you see that generally there is this three percentage point gap uh, between the treasury rate and this junk bond sub BAA rate. Uh, sometimes it gets bigger, um, like just after 9-11, um, during the couple years afterwards, it got up to 8%. Um, that's a big gap when the normal gap is 3%. You think of a 3% gap being that your average risky company, you'll lose 3% of your money each year if you invest in a bond there rather than a treasury. That you kind of kind of invert that and say, well, that says that there's a probability of about 1 30th uh, that a company will go bankrupt, um, that an average company lives for maybe 30 years before something bad happens, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in bankruptcy court. Um, that's about right. Um, an 8% spread, um, as you had in 2002 and 2003, is rather large. 
seems to be indicative of a certain amount of panic on the part of financial markets. Um, a panic that was then relatively quickly eased between 2002 and 2005 as spreads returned to more or less normal levels. And then starting in 2007, they started to diverge. And then starting in September 2008, all hell broke loose. And at the peak, if you were a risky company wanting to borrow, you had to pay 12.5% more in interest rates on this measure than if you were the US Treasury uh, wanting to borrow, which means that people were kind of expecting one chance in eight that you would go bankrupt over the course of the next year, um, which is A, high, um, and B, large. Um, and C, um, if you're a company thinking about building up your capacity and buying a new, fac buying a new factory, and you're quoting an interest rate of 15%, um, you're going to think twice about whether you want to invest in expanding your capacity at all. So that even though here during this period, this is exactly the period when the Treasury is dropping the interest rates it controls, the short-term safe nominal interest rates to zero, um, and long-term Treasury interest rates are falling along, but the financial markets aren't. Uh, this is the time when the financial market is bidding the interest rate that risky companies actually have to pay tomorrow, up to 15% or so. There's that much slippage between the interest rates that Federal Reserve's control and the interest rates that companies have to pay. Um, but there's also the inflation discount. Uh, and as companies really don't care about the nominal interest rate, they care about the real interest rate instead. Uh, if you tell them that they have to pay an interest rate of 10% per year so that the amount of money they'll have to be paid back is quadrupled in 14 years, um, oh, but by the, way, by the way, there's going to be inflation over the next 14 years, so the price, of the, the price level in 14 years is going to be four times what it is today, the companies will say, big what? We have to pay back four times as many dollars in 14 years, but the products we make will be selling for four times as much in 14 years. That's a zero as far as we're concerned. And so in order to figure out what the long-term risky real interest rate is, we not only take the short-term nominal safe treasury rate, we add on to it the term premium to get the long-term safe nominal treasury rate, we add on the risk term to get the risky long-term nominal interest rate, we then subtract off the expected inflation rate to get the long-term risky real interest rate. Um, how do we calculate what the expected inflation rate is? Well, since 2003, the U.S. Treasury does it for us. Um, the U.S. Treasury now issues two bonds, one of which just pays you a fixed interest rate every year. Um, that's this sucker up here. The other of which pays you an interest rate each year, which is equal to the interest rate on the bond plus the rate of inflation. That's this blue line down here. Um, the gap between these two lines is what people expect the average rate of inflation to be over the next 10 years, or at least what the people trading in this particular market I think the average rate of inflation is going to be over the next 10 years. Um, and since they started up this market in 2003, you know, well, the inflation rate that people expected was bouncing around between 2 and 2.8%, then bouncing around between 2.2 and 2.8% through the early 2000s, until we get into mid-2008, uh, and then all of a sudden expected inflation falls to zero um, as the financial crisis really hits. And then starting early in 2009, it recovers to more or less normal. Uh, it's still showing signs of uncertainty. Uh, the inflation rate, expected inflation rate in early 2010 over the next 10 years got down to 1.5%. Uh, since then, it's gone back up to 2.4%. People now expect inflation over the next 10 years to be more or less its normal 2% plus uh, for the next decade. Uh, which is why conservatives on the Federal Reserve right now tend to say the Federal Reserve must be doing something right. Uh, because if the Federal Reserve were doing something wrong, um, well, then either people would be expecting some chance of deflation, and this expectation would be way down here, or people would be expecting some chance of accelerating inflation, and it would be up here. The fact that the inflation discount is now trading in its normal range tells us that Fed policy is about right, or so the inflation hawks tend to say. You can then subtract this off, and you get our estimate of junk bond long-term risky real interest rates. Um, this is probably the best series to look at for figuring out what the R that goes into the investment savings equation is. Um, now, what is it? Um, now, what is it that businesses have to pay in terms of real claims over goods and services in the future if they want to borrow money and use it to buy factories and expand their occupations um, or expand their operations? And in this graph, you can indeed genuinely see the salience of the recession and the financial crisis, um, what it did to businesses' cost of borrowing. And you can also see that things have gotten, well, you know, now not down to mid-2000s normal yet, um, <clears throat> but that right now things aren't that depressed. The cost of capital, even to risky businesses, is not that high. Um, that most of business reluctance to invest is right now a product of low confidence and also an observation of the fact there's little demand out there. Here's adding putting everything up, um, the wedges, the gap between the short-term safe interest rate that the Federal Reserve actually controls since 2003, um, this little red thing here, showing low interest rates after 9-11 and during the first stages of the recovery, followed by raising interest rates back to normal levels in the mid-2000s, uh, and then the, starting with the coming of the financial crisis, bunches of cuts in interest rates until they hit and stay at zero. Uh, the difference between the safe nominal short-term interest rate the Federal Reserve controls and the long-term real interest rate that matters for demand and spending. Uh, and I think that shows you both the power and the limits um, of monetary policy. That is, as the Federal Reserve held interest rates very low in the early 2000s, it eventually persuaded financial markets that they were going to stay down. And so they did get a significant decline in real interest rates, um, which they wanted in order to make it easier for firms to borrow and invest. Uh, but then starting here, well, all I can say about this is that interest rates have probably been somewhat lower than if the Federal Reserve had just kept them at 5% um, since the start of 2007. Um, if the Federal Reserve influences, it does not control these interest rates. And let me stop there and continue on Thursday.